Uh, give a warm welcome to Anna. Anna's Zebras. Thanks so much for having me. I have to say, this is the first time I've presented to a tech audience about this book, and I was I was just uh, sharing on Twitter, I, learning about brain scans and, and 3D printing of brains right before my talk. I usually talk to a lot of transportation nerds, and so this is this is fun and really different. Um, so a little bit about me and, and why I'm here. Um, I am low vision. I was born with a, it's a neurological condition called nystagmus, which makes my eyes shake a little bit all the time. And um, it, I, I, it reduces my vis visual acuity. They don't fully understand what causes the nystagmus, why um, everyone has it a little bit differently. Growing up, uh, I didn't know anyone else with nystagmus. And so I had a lot of shame around it. I remember, I actually hated public speaking because I remember in middle school, at uh, one of my first presentations, the teacher said, you have to make eye contact with the audience. And I can't see your eyes, right? And so it was something that I couldn't do and I, I really developed a lot of shame around public speaking um, as, a, as a result of that. And now, in the last month or two, my job is basically public speaking. I'm doing presentations almost every day about this book and so I'm, I'm working on that. Um, and I, I appreciate you all being here and, and listening. Um, so this is the book. Uh, I, I published it in uh, this summer with Island Press, which is uh, an, environmental, an environmental justice publisher, which is kind of exciting uh, because the book really focuses on accessibility and the need to include people who can't drive and can't afford to drive into uh, our conversations around transportation planning. Um, and this image here on the screen, and I'm gonna try to do my best to describe some of the images just as a practice of accessibility for folks who are, are low vision and blind. Um, this image on the screen is a shadow of me walking along the street in Florida. I was there for work and I was trying to get from the hotel I was staying at uh, to somewhere to get food because uh, part of my vision is, um, my visual impairment is that I don't see well enough to drive. And uh, I thought this was sort of an appropriate image also for today. I'm thinking a lot about, uh, I was just reading you know, the latest updates from the hurricane in Florida and thinking about all the folks there who can't evacuate, right? Who don't have access to cars, um, who may not you know, be able to drive. Uh, what they're facing right now. So just thinking a little about non-drivers more broadly, like who are all the different people who can't drive? Um, it's people like me who are visually impaired, low vision folks, um, people with other kinds of disabilities, mobility disabilities sometimes can prevent driving. There's an image here of Erica, she's a power wheelchair user, and she can drive but she can't afford a vehicle that's wheelchair accessible. And so you know, there's, there's sort of this continuum of can't drive, can't drive every day because perhaps you have a chronic health condition or a mental health condition, anxiety or PTSD that can have good days or bad days, or maybe you have a disability that prevents you from having a job where you can earn enough to afford a car or afford a car that you know, meets your, your accessibility requirements. Um, and then people with epilepsy, um, people with traumatic brain injuries, I think every time I, I talk to an audience I hear about more stories and more experiences of people who can't drive. Um, because of disabilities. And there's also a lot of folks out there, right, who can't drive um, and wouldn't identify as disabled. And there's a picture here on the bottom left of my grandma. Uh, she was one of those people. She had a heart condition and she just kept on passing out um, when she was driving. She kept driving. Um, she lived in a rural area and she didn't want to move somewhere else. Um, she didn't want to move away. Uh, but, you know, a lot of folks in the, in the position that she, she never would have identified herself as disabled, but driving was not a safe option for her anymore. Um, and that's true for so many folks who are aging out of driving um, in all, all over the country, right? So much of the country, it's so hard to get around without being able to drive yourself. Non-drivers also include people who can't afford to drive, um, people who can't afford cars, uh, people who are perhaps recent immigrants to this country, and don't have a driver's license, uh, maybe don't uh, know how to drive, um, can't afford a car, some combination of all those elements together. Uh, households that are, are uh, households that are households of recent immigrants in our country are seven times less likely to have a access to a vehicle. Uh, and black households are three times more likely to lack access to a vehicle. So big racial um, and, uh, and disparities, right, between vehicle ownership. This image here on the, on the bottom in the middle is the seven bus in Seattle. Uh, it's the bus I took here today, actually, and I was kind of, it was kind of a cool moment um, taking it, actually. I took it to pick up my kid from school, and then um, we took the couple buses over here. Uh, but uh, it, I think I heard three or four other languages aside from English being spoken 
on, on a 7. Um, and that, uh, the, the folks who rely on the 7 bus and, and folks who live in, in communities uh, like Rainier Valley really are the communities that haven't been able to move away from transit even during the pandemic. And this is a picture of a bunch of folks um, deep in the pandemic, as you can tell by the masks that everyone's wearing, um, and the ridership of that route and a lot of the routes that serve low-income communities in our, in our state, really that ridership um, stayed high. So non-drivers also include young people, right? Uh, there's an image on the bottom right. This is also the 7 bus. Uh, I spend a lot of time on the 7, so I take a lot of pictures. Um, these are high school students. And uh, everyone under the age of 18 gets free transit in our state, which is pretty awesome. It includes Amtrak, too, and ferries. It's, it's pretty cool. But also the buses. Um, and young people, many of them, even if they're old enough to drive, are choosing not to, can't afford to, um, don't want to get driver's licenses. And those um, numbers have really gone up since I was a teenager in the 90s. Uh, around 50% of 16-year-olds in, in the U.S. had driver's licenses, and now it's uh, closer to 20, 25%. Um, so a big, big drop in, in that uh, percentage of 16-year-olds you know, going out there and they're getting a driver's license the first day they possibly can. And then non-drivers also include young people. Um, and this image on the top right is an image of my kiddo who's here in the back with me today, um, and uh, one of our neighbors uh, waiting through the school bus. And you know our school busing system across the country, we recognize that not every kid can, you know, kids can't drive themselves, and not every kid has a parent or a caregiver that can always drive them everywhere they need to go. Uh, and so kids are part of this, this non-driving universe. So just pausing for a moment, and I'm gonna make this a little interactive. If anyone wants to share um, in your own experience, maybe it's you, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a, a relative, maybe it's someone on your block, um, in a social group that you're involved with, someone at work. Do you know anyone in your life, um, and are you comfortable sharing uh, that who can't drive, can't afford to drive, chooses not to drive, chooses not to have a car, maybe doesn't have a driver's license? Yes? Uh, I, don't, I don't drive, and it's just mostly my choice. It's transit so Yeah, great, thanks for sharing. And you know what, I realize um, I don't have someone to help me call on people, but if you can just call out, because I can't always see hands. After this front row, yeah, go for it. Uh, I'm an ocular albino, so I have to say, it's like, oh my gosh. Albino, so I have uh, this low vision. Yeah. So I've never had a driver's license. Uh, and yeah, I just take transit or I rely on my partner to drive me places sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it kind of limits what cities you can live in. It does. Oh my gosh. I have to say, I like never met anyone with this diagnosis growing up, and now I, almost every book event I meet someone with this diagnosis, which is just wild. Anyway, very cool. Anyone else? See, yeah, I'm going to have. Uh, after COVID, I just donated my car, and I've just been taking transit everywhere. I'm saving money, and I but I never have to worry about getting somewhere. It's just the Google app everywhere. So it's actually pretty easy to get around in Seattle. And I haven't had a car in four years. That's awesome. Yeah, Seattle is one of the better places in this country, for sure. All right, let's do one or two more. Uh, I do drive here in the States, but whenever I travel, I make the conscious choice of not to drive, uh, whether it's London or Tokyo or like other cities, because they have like much better public transportation. So I didn't have to drive and make the conscious choice not to. But here in the States, unfortunately, it's not that accessible and it's just too slow, so I have to drive. But if I do have the choice, I would conscious choice. Yeah, it is much slower not to drive in the U.S. That's okay. except for maybe New York City. All right, one more maybe. I talked to a couple of folks um, who, you know, have acquired seizures as adults, and, and that frustration of losing it, and also, you know, kind of being able to drive most of the time, right? But then there's just that risk, and um, you know, having to make that choice when is it not safe? And you know, I so I tried to pass the vision test when I was a teenager. Um, so I was like, I, I can drive, I can do this. I couldn't pass the vision test. I still thought I could drive. And I uh, convinced a friend to teach me how to drive in her mom's car, and I drove that car up a tree, and it's 
scared me. Um, and it, 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 we were both okay, but it really, for, you know, there's this, when you sort of can drive, right, it, it, maybe it's safe, like this, oh, I'm gonna maybe try or push the limits, and um, yeah, I was lucky that no one got hurt and it scared me enough to not try, but I've heard so many people wrestle with this. Is it safe for me to drive? Is it not safe? Um, and so many people who are aging out of driving. Um, so this, these numbers may surprise you, but all together, um, there are about 30% of our population here in Washington State, and this probably holds nationally as well. I've seen numbers from Wisconsin. A lot of other states don't have good data, um, and I don't have national data, but 30% of the population in Washington State are not drivers whether that's by choice, um, because we can't afford to, because we have a physical disability that prevents us from driving, um, or because we're too young to drive, or I've chosen not or can't get a driver's license. So, big number. Um, and I think it's an exciting number because it gives us the potential to really start to push for change and push for communities that work better uh, for all of us, whether that's better transit, uh, smoother sidewalks, better biking connections, um, you know, locations of things closer to where we need to go, affordable housing, so um, all of these pieces. And I wanna just talk a few, uh, share a few stories of some of the ways and, and the impact of not driving on people that I've gotten to know in Washington State and throughout the country, um, and then some of the solutions, right, that we might be able to advocate for. The first thing is that in, in the reality, outside of big cities like Seattle, um, Seattle region, in most of our state and in most of our country, if you can't drive, the easiest way to get around is to ask friends or family if you have that social network for rides. Um, and honestly, I, I, you know, even in Seattle, sometimes I do that tonight. Like tonight, I um, asked my husband to drive because it was going to be a long trip back uh, to Rainier Valley, and I wasn't feeling it. I had kind of a rough um, bus ride the other night on a seven bus, and so I was like, you know what? Can you drive me in? And so, you know, and it's fine, but asking for favors comes with an emotional burden, right? There's, there's always sort of a negotiation of, okay, if I do this thing for you, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, and there's a quote here from Jaime Torres, who's a non-driver who lives in Pasco, Washington, um, over in the Tri-Cities, really speaking to how that has made him choose not to do a lot of social activities, um, and then resulting in a lot of isolation and depression. And I, I hear these stories again and again from folks. Um, so how do we make it possible so you don't have to rely on favors? Um, maybe it's an option, maybe it's a nice option for you some of the time, but what are, what are the other ways, right? Um, transit, obviously. I uh, heard many transit stories from you all um, just right now, and this is an image of Abby Griffith. She lives down in the Vancouver, Washington area, and she grew up in Ridgefield, Washington, which is north of Vancouver, but it's a super, well, it was a super rural area, now it's getting a lot of development, but had no transit service when she was growing up there. And so um, I also, I grew up outside of Olympia, Washington, and so her story really resonated with me because both of us, when we moved to places with transit, felt this, this sort of liberation, this freedom and joy of being able to go to the grocery store, right, when we wanted to. Um, you know, simple things like that. So transit really is, is freedom. Um, and, and part of that, right, is being able to get to transit. And I think this is the, the piece that we forget about, and for folks who are not disabled, um, perhaps it's less of a big, or something that we encounter, um, but we need that sidewalk, that pedestrian infrastructure, perhaps bike infrastructure to be able to connect to transit. And if it doesn't exist, um, then, then transit can't be an option. Maybe we have to use paratransit or we can't you know, get there at all. And so uh, this is a quote from Tanisha Sepulveda. She's a Seattle resident and a power wheelchair user. And these are some images of her. Um, one is where she lives in, in, south, in uh, southwest Seattle, Delridge area where she has to roll from her house to the bus stop in the street because the sidewalk is too cracked up and too bumpy um, and it's missing some curb ramps and it's a, a pretty pretty busy street when we went out to film this with her i didn't feel comfortable standing you know behind her in front of her because it was you know such fast traffic um, and then you know there's also sort of the temporary barriers that we get when we have scooters that get misparked in the street um, when we get like eight frame signs um, snow bushes Blackberry danglers here, that's a real issue. If you're blind or low vision, running into those is not fun. Um, so really making sure that we have that, that pedestrian network as well. And, and the crossings too, right? Like the, you have to have, you're trying to get to the bus stop, you need to have an accessible crossing to get there, a street that's um, comfortable and safe and not too high speed, um, not too many turning vehicles, that you can really make that crossing safely. 
I, you know, hear a lot of when I, especially when I'm presenting to, to audiences um, here in Washington State. Well, okay, you know, we have. Is transit really the solution? Aren't there better solutions than sort of what we're thinking about as, as fixed route buses or light rail? Why don't we do micro transit? Why don't we do on-demand smaller vehicles? And I have lived in an area of South Seattle now that has those like vehicle transit um, uh, on-demand shuttles now since 20, I think they started in 2018. There was a little pause during the pandemic. And I think you know there's, there's real challenges with scale with some of those solutions. Um, but also challenges with car seats, and I, I stick to things. I think you know we design solutions sometimes without thinking about all the people that need to use the system. And if you are designing a van that requires car seats, and then you're expecting a parent to uh, slot that car seat to the transit stop, perhaps, um, or you know from the the on-demand vehicle onto the light rail and around as they run errands all day, that's going to exclude parents. And so um, there's an image here of some parents, and this is actually Detroit. I noticed there at the main bus terminal, um, trying to carry a bus, uh, a car seat with them. Um, and this middle image is, is my kid. This is a solution that I, I learned about from the blind community. It's like a harness that works for bigger kids as an alternative to car seats. Um, it's you know not as safe, but for for you know if you can't have a car seat with you, um, if you can't carry it, you can use these. And um, we need to make sure that we're thinking about having those kinds of systems available or car seats available. Um, in shared vehicles, whether that be micro transit or a ride hail. Um, this image on the right is a uh, wave up, because um, that's the other question I get to. Well, why do we need transit? Should we really be investing in transit? Because soon we're going to have autonomous vehicles. And um, this was actually just a couple weeks ago. I was in Phoenix doing a book talk, and I took wave up back to the airport. It was pretty cool. I had been pretty skeptical that the technology could work, and I still, I mean, Phoenix is a really different environment than, say, downtown Seattle, or downtown, um, you know, crowded areas with a lot of pedestrians, but for me as someone who always, when I get in a ride hill vehicle, like an Uber or Lyft, there's that judgment you feel sort of from the driver. It was interesting to me to actually sort of feel for the first time that I had kind of the freedom that a driver normally has. Like, I was just in the vehicle and I didn't have to perform anything for anybody, so. That was interesting, and then I had a I had a beer and a paper bag, and I was like, can I drink it in here, or will I get banned forever by Google? And like all of my Google Drive, you know, everything will be lost, and I, I decided not to risk it. So, um, but yeah, I think you know the other part of this too is the is the cost piece, and I, this Waymo ride was super cheap, and it was like 15 bucks for a half hour ride. Um, reminded me a lot of you know when Uber and Lyft were super cheap, and now we're we're paying more of the real cost of those, and so. Um, for a lot of folks, because so many folks who are not drivers are low income, um, these aren't going to be accessible financially um, for people. And so that's why we still need to be thinking about how do we make transit work? Um, how do we make our communities walkable and bikeable? And also, so the bikeable piece, right? I think there's a lot of people who assume, oh, well, biking can only work for some people. I want to push people to think more broadly about can biking work for, if biking does work, um, for a lot more people than I think there's like assumptions about. Um, and with the right vehicles and the right uh, places to ride, and safe and secure places to store, um, larger trikes and e-bikes and cargo bikes, um, it can work for even more people. Um, there's an image here on the bottom of my friend Rachel and I. We're both low vision parents who can't drive, um, but we can bike, and e-bikes for us have been awesome um, to be able to get around. Um, there's an image here on the upper left of Cody Shane, who lives in Chewila, Washington. It's up north of Spokane, and um, he's got developmental disabilities, um, and he uses a trike to get around. Um, and it, for him, it's it's great. And so I think there's you know th these assumptions that like disabled people can and do don't bike are are false. Um, but also you know there are a lot of power wheelchair users who um, and there's a quote here from Ian Mackey, who's a power wheelchair user from Port Angeles who talks about, wouldn't it be cool if we had some of these developments that are happening with e-bikes and trikes and scooters, um, those lighter batteries, the ability um, you know, the, to, to handle bumps, um, to be able to be out in all weather, wouldn't that be nice if some of that translated to power wheelchairs? Because right now, the battery capacity and the um, ability to be out in the rain is really limited in most power wheelchairs. And so thinking about how do we expand that as well. And a lot of it has to do with power wheelchairs being reimbursed through healthcare, and so there's just not the incentives for those companies to innovate. Um, but there could be, and there should be. So the underlying piece of all this, though, is land use, right? How do we make our communities less car dependent? 
um, through land use and zoning. And right now, you know, housing is incredibly expensive, and it's uh, especially for folks who can't afford to drive um, or who are disabled and low income. We are priced out of places where there is good transit. And I, I can't tell you how many non-drivers across the state I've spoken to who would die to live where I live, close to light rail in Seattle. Um, but that's not an option. And there's a quote here from Vaughn. Um, he says, "When more affordability means moving further out. Moving further out means uh, limited transportation. And I think that, that really is like the root of um, the problem. So we need affordable housing, and we need it not to be on the outskirts. Uh, we need it close to transit. And then we need to be thinking about how do we change communities and zoning like this image. This is from, um, let's see, St. Louis. Um, this is the Chick-fil-A that I was trying to walk to with my kid. And just, you know, absolutely inhospitable environment to be a pedestrian in. Um, with the drive throughs and the scale and the lack of sidewalks, um, lack of trees uh, and shade. So, you know, how, do, how can we make our communities more comfortable, more enjoyable places to be? So what can you do? <laughs> the Week Without Driving Challenge. Um, this is a really exciting piece of, of and, and the timing of this actually works really well. Because The Week Without Driving is an annual event. It takes place next week. It uh, starts Monday, September 30th. It's a challenge that we launched here in Washington State in 2021. And in the last four years, it grew here in Washington State. Last year, it became a national challenge. And this year, um, it is taking place in all 50 states. We have over 400 organizations co-hosting it. Um, and every day, I get my news alerts. And there's you know, a half dozen articles from different communities around the country that are doing really cool organizing around this. Um, the idea is that you sign up and you try not to drive for a week. And some of you are already doing that, I know. Um, but uh, do, it, do it again, sign up, uh, share about your experiences. Um, and for those of you who do normally drive, the idea is you can still get rides from people. So if you need to use Uber or Lyft, if you need to ask for a ride, that's not, you know, not doing the challenge. It's experiencing what life is like for someone who can't drive or can't afford to drive. Um, and then reflecting also, you know, we were talking about, you know, people who can't afford to live close to transit, um, reflecting on your own life and, and, you know, what choices you have that other people might not have. Um, and so you can sign up online, weekwithoutdriving.org. You can share on social media with the hashtag weekwithoutdriving. Um, and you can encourage people you know who are decision makers, perhaps in the transportation space, perhaps, perhaps elected leaders, um, perhaps just friends and family um, to, to participate as well. Um, and this is an image, I think this is from our second year of Week Without Driving. This is in Tacoma um, with Crystal Monteros, who's an incredible activist there, the person who really helped me understand the importance of that sidewalk connection to transit. Um, and she is trying to convince some elected leaders to help her get funding to build a, a missing sidewalk to connect her bus stop um, to the apartment complex where she lives, because right now it's, it's just mud. Um, but it's just, it should not be the case, right, in, in this state. Um, we can do better than that. So um, here's the book. There's a discount code. I know you're ha they're handing out some copies, too. Um, I'm happy to take a couple questions if I can get some uh, question help, um, if there's anything anyone wants to ask about uh, what I share. I'd like to hear more about the process of finding people to interview for the book, and how long it took, and kind of like how, how you decided which communities to visit. Yes. Um, so the book came out of work. So my day job is I work for Disability Rights Washington. We're a nonprofit, a statewide um, nonprofit here. And the program I direct there is called the Disability Mobility Initiative. And we started in 2020, and the idea was really as a storytelling project. And so we went out and interviewed 300 non-drivers, or I interviewed 300 non-drivers from throughout the state. We're a very small program. Um, and the idea was to try to find folks from every legislative district so that when we went to elected leaders to ask for more funding for state transit, they couldn't say, oh, well, nobody rides the bus in my community, or nobody needs sidewalks in my community. And we could be like, no, no, no. This person here, they live in your neighborhood, and they need sidewalks. And so that's where the um, stories originally came from. And then I selected a handful of folks to, to be profiled in the book. Um, but that, that story map still exists online on the Disability Rights Washington website. Um, and it's something we haven't added to in the last year or two. Um, but we may start doing some more again. It's, um, and this, unfortunately, the, the interface itself is this defunct interface from Night Labs, and I, I, I need mean, to figure out a different interface. <laughs> so, um, but the, the stories there are, are super cool. 
other than that. Yeah. So you mentioned the whole sidewalk connection thing, which in some ways feels almost more challenging than building out trams in some places. Do you have ideas how to pitch that as a thing that needs to be done? Because that's almost more of an infrastructure change than adding a bus on a road that's already there. Yeah, no, it is it is a challenge. And I mean I think part of it is when we build new developments, it has to be part of it, right? So there's the like, you know, when new things happen, we could we could do that and be more proactive about it. Retrofitting though, like the city of Seattle, fifty percent, almost fifty percent of, of the sidewalks in Seattle are either missing, or the roads in Seattle either have missing sidewalks or inaccessible sidewalks because of the lack of curb ramps or cracks and bumps. And so we did like a very rough, like, you know back of the envelope cal calculation, um, what it would cost to, to fully address that. And it's close, it's $5 billion, right? Which is way bigger <laughs> than what we're doing, you know, in a current transportation levy, it's around 1.7 billion. So bigger issue, um, not gonna be solved up overnight. Um, it, it's gonna take bonding and yeah. Um, so part of, if any of y'all live in Seattle on the ballot this fall, there is gonna be a transportation levy. There's some sidewalk funding in that, more than there has been. Um, we did a lot of work at Disability Rights Washington to have sidewalks be a big part of the conversation for that. So that was cool. Um, and then the other piece of it is that there's supposed to be a work group convened to develop a plan for a, a bond measure. So that would you know, not give us probably a five billion, but chip off more of, of that, that piece. But you know, it's a lot of money, um, yeah. pretty sizable communication gap between the politicians and the bus drivers in a lot of places, of, including here in King County. Has there been much of an effort to get the union representatives uh, involved for any sort of accessibility efforts that are, are going on? That's a great question. I mean, I, I know the folks at ATU and, and, and the person there who interfaces with the community is great, Jeremy. Um, I, I would say, you know, and there's so many drivers that are wonderful. I think we do hear from some disabled riders that they want drivers to have more training about how to work with people with disabilities. It's but a huge gap. It's a huge gap. The funny thing is, though, you know, I've been, my friend Cecilia is a wheelchair user. She's um, my colleague at Disability Rights Washington. And, she you know, really wants to do some sort of best practices on how to do wheelchair securement on buses. And she started talking to all her other friends who are wheelchair users. And each person has a very you know, different chair and very different needs. And she has a, she's realized that it's actually so complicated because each person has very different preferences. Um, and so, yeah. And there's many different models of the buses. Yes. And each one of those has a different system yes. for securing the seat. Too. And so, some people yeah. like the like back and facing kind of arm thing. I mean, there's just so many. And, and so I guess maybe standardization of the buses is part of it. I, I think pushing for more flexible space on the buses, so we don't have you know folks in wheelchairs competing against folks in walkers, competing against folks with grocery carts, competing against parents with strollers. Right. Right now, there's not enough space that's flexible. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, they're building a brand new highway, elevated highway outside of, of Spokane, going north towards Canada, because I don't know what's up there, but um, a border crossing, I guess, and some agricultural interest. I think, you know, I mean, in Washington State, we're not spending too much on new highway expansion, but I think that's something that, you know, we all know induces more driving, and from a climate perspective, that's not what we need to be doing. So. Um, that's part of it. I think the other, I mean, there's a, it's going to be a huge project with the interstate bridge replacement between here in Vancouver. Um, and, you know, perhaps that needs to happen, but let's not do it in a way that's expanding highway capacity. And um, that's a, a multi billion dollar project there. So I think those are some pieces. Um, but the reality is just like, you know, even just maintaining the highway and infrastructure systems that we have currently, even without adding sidewalks, we're not putting enough money in that, right? Our bridges are falling down. Um, it, we don't have, we're not really prepared to pay for what it costs to maintain the system. Um, yeah, so I think another piece of it is, you know, that land use and, right, how do we drive less and maybe we can maintain a smaller system then um, by better land use choices. All right, so uh, 
like if people want to get involved in you know, trying to support like these movements and trying to do some activist stuff, like what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, if, uh, well, Wake Without Dragon is just, you know, it's a fun thing you can do, whether or not you're involved with a group. There are also a bunch of Wake Without Dragon events going on in the, in the region um, next week, a couple in Seattle. Um, there are some really wonderful groups that do uh, advocacy in the transportation space. Um, let's see, uh, Moo Redmond is up here in this area. Kelly Reaper is their executive director. She's great. Um, so if you're in this area, um, in Bellevue, Complete Streets Bellevue, in Seattle, um, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, um, does a lot of local activism, Transit Riders Union, so, um, and if you have a specific request, you can come ask me, but those are some, and yeah, if you have any other ones you want to shout out, yeah? Uh, okay, just, you're, you're asking me about Yeah, no, are there any other, I mean, I just, I'm probably missing some too, so if other folks have other ideas. Um, I definitely encourage you, I think, you know, engaging the local groups on this is great. 